LA now too. How long have you lived there? Yeah, I didn't have far to go. I've been there um, 10 years. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was kind of a surprise to me that I was even down there, but it's, it's been great actually. It's challenging in a different way. Yeah. yeah Did you totally move different. there to pursue acting or no, was not there, like, at all. a love for it? No, I went down there because, um, you know, my, my ex-wife wanted to be close to her family. So we were just down there and I was talking to a filmmaker who wanted to do a documentary about my DJ life and yeah. that actually never ended up happening. But we ended up doing this, this film together. So, that, so that's how it happened. Oh, I, really? Yeah, yeah. So I'd already been down there a couple of years. Yeah. That wasn't the focus on going to LA at all. <laughs> but you know, it makes <laughs> it my life. Kinda like, but it makes my life in LA a lot more interesting, right? Yeah, no, that definitely I mean, is. That's definitely not what I would have pictured. <laughs> it's, not what, it's not what I would have pictured either, but it's, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's great. I mean, there's so much more to do in LA when you're doing that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I can imagine. I lived there actually for two years and yeah. There's a lot of what people. were you doing? I, I moved there when I was 19. I sold everything and I moved there. I'm going to that. Off a Greyhound bus, like literally 36 hours with two duffel bags, like the full. Perfect. <laughs> I know, yeah. It led me to be up here. I kind of, nice. life was serendipitous, I think, if you it just is, kind of is, go with is. the flow. Yeah. That's yeah. how I ended up in San Francisco in the first place. So I just, I, I backpacked around America just traveling around. Yeah. And I just, there was a love interest and I, and I came here, you know, I was, I was staying at the, the Globe Hostel mm -hmm. just down the street here. And they're up there for two months, and there was a love interest. So I, you know, I wanted to come back to be with her. The love interest didn't work out, but the real love interest turned out to be the city itself. Right? Yeah. So I came out here just with a bag like you did, and you know, some DJ mixtapes, and a, you know, and a suit just in case I would get a job. I never even ended up getting one. <laughs> that was actually was going to be my first question because you moved out in 1990, and you were in your 20s, like mid 20s. Yeah. Something like that? So yeah. that's like... Yeah. You, early, early 20s. Early yeah, 20s. You, uh, you experienced like a lot of life already in England at that point. Yeah, um, I think we started a bit earlier in England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No one ever carded this, ID'd us or anything. So we were drinking in bars at the 13, and not 13, but 14 for sure. Yeah. I remember going to my first nightclub at like 14 and then 15. We were going to like see live bands or punk bands and stuff like that. And by the time 17 came around, we were going to, to you know, discos, dancing, okay. dancing a lot. It was hip hop and rare groove in there in those days, you know, that was the sound, electro. When did your, uh, your love for like DJing start? Was it before you went to San Francisco? Uh, um, I, I was living in London, I moved to London to, to get a degree in business and when I was there I was out clubbing like probably three nights a week, maybe four. Mm -hmm. And I just fell in love with, you know, the DJ culture in London. I mean, there'd be Giles Peterson playing you know, at, uh, talking loud at this party on Sunday, playing amazing music on Sunday. And it, the dancers were just so, you know, so beautiful, so into it, so free, but dressed to the nines in jazz suits and stuff. You know? <laughs> and very mixed, white, black, gay, straight and everything. It was cool. Um, and then Acid House exploded when I was in London. Yeah. And I didn't actually necessarily love it at first. It was too, it was too sort of machiny. You know, for me, I was from sort of jazz and hip hop, and I want, yeah, it was just, but the kids were going crazy, right? They had this new dance, they had new drugs, they had like, there were smiley t shirts and everything. You knew a house head when you saw one. Mm. Um, and then somebody invited me to go to a Tonka a sound system party where Harvey and Chucky were DJing, and that's when I got it. I was like, oh, wow. I liked the music. It was, they had that acid house, but they also had disco and soul and like, you know, the sort of pop rock hits or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the, the atmosphere was ecstatic. And then I remember thinking, wow, you know, what, a, what a thing to be doing, to be moving the crowd like that. You know, maybe, maybe I could do that, you know. But until then, I'd never had that feeling that I actually wanted to be a DJ. So you started learning in London before you moved to San Francisco? Um, I, I was always buying records. I didn't become a DJ DJ actually for a living until I moved to San Francisco mm -hmm. in 1990. But I came here and there was, you know, I had a green card because my mum had married an American, so I had a reason to come to America to live. I'd fallen mm -hmm. in love with the city by then. Um, so I was missing the music that I'd had in London. That was the thing. That's what really prompted me to have to DJ. Mm -hmm. So my friends would, would, would come over from, from England and visit me, and we'd sit around in my living room in the evening just listening to my records. And they'd be like, we've got to get you at club night, man. We want to go dancing to this. <laughs> so that's how it happened. Yeah. So it didn't, you didn't really pursue it. It, it like fell into you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, <laughs> for I, I, the love of it. It did. But that's like you said about serendipity. You know, that's the best way, right? It's mm -hmm. the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it was no, it was kind of effortless. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, 
What is the first final you remember purchasing? Do you I can have remember a recollection? The yeah, I do actually. It was a seven inch by Cool and the Gang, and I bought it for oh. Get Down On It, which is just like a generic funk song. But the B side is Summer Madness, which is like a sort of all time favorite jazz jam. I still absolutely love that record. Mm -hmm. So I bought that when I was 13. So I could actually still remember. You've been collecting since you were 13. Yeah, that's that pretty impressive. That was the first record I bought. I can't yeah. imagine the size of your collection at this point. It's actually not that big. It could have been way bigger, right? Yeah. But I've I've learned to thin it out and let them go. It's like, you know, they're like they're like lovers. You can it's nice to enjoy them, but sometimes you can let them <laughs> let go. Them go. You don't I have like to keep you don't have to keep them all. I like that analogy. Yeah. Um. So you did move in 1990, and you started your iconic uh, uh, full moon parties. Yeah. Uh, the Wicked Sound System uh, parties with you know and um, the rest of the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. So well, well, we didn't have a sound system there, so we were just wicked. <laughs> <laughs> just wicked. Yeah. We. I remember the first um, party. Yano had just arrived. I mean, I already had you know friends that were here, uh, and we all. I'd already started DJing a little bit. Marky had been out to visit mm. me, and he brought some records. But the night Yana came was the night that we all decided as a group, let's go and throw a full moon party. Mm. So we got this, um, my friend Ernie Munson, that was a part of Wicked in those days, very early on for the first six months or something, had a van, a truck, and he knew how to rent a sound system. We went to JK Sound, we got a little sound system, and they didn't know we were gonna be on a beach trashing it with sand, so they gave us these beautiful clip <laughs> speakers, really <laughs> nice wooden speakers, and after we returned, they're like, Next time, maybe we'll give you like a different set. <laughs> yeah. Not quite so nice. But it was, yeah, it was really small at first, humble, you know, maybe like 40, 50 close friends, some of our, you know, gay friends that we'd met from the club scene, and us, these sort of English ravers, and it grew really quickly. I think the very next week we did our first uh, party in the basement at Big Heart City. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, maybe before that, I think we. I can't remember if that was first or we did a party in the sex shop above um, a sex district above BPM Records that had just opened up. Oh, that's they really had a loft cool. up there. That was yeah. that might have been on the first one actually. It's yeah. it's really cool because renegades have become such a big part in the last few years of San Francisco like nightlife again. Mm -hmm. It's great. Um, I mean, it, the last few decades with Sunset as well. Oh, um, sure. But yeah. it's like every weekend there's people throwing it. So yeah, you guys good. are like some of the first to to do that. Uh, how did it evolve from doing that on the beach in San Francisco to uh, importing a sound system mm. and getting the Greyhound bus mm. uh, and touring across the U.S. doing right. what well, you're doing? Well, we wanted to have a sound system right away, but obviously like a good sound system was, was going to cost some money. So I think after the first year of throwing these smaller parties and throwing a lot of full moon parties, we had a pretty substantial following. We started doing bigger club nights mm -hmm. at... Um, King Street Garage and Townsend, which is a bigger club that's now been demolished and turned into a parking lot. So we were doing these bigger nights and we started saving all of our money. We pay ourselves just enough to eat. Mm -hmm. And we saved all the money um, to get this turbo sound rig. It was 15K. It was custom designed by Tony Andrews, who's a very respected English sound you know, engineer, mm -hmm. sound system engineer. He, uh, he helped us design it and, he, and then we shipped it over and it, I think it landed in 94. So it took a while. Mm -hmm. so until then we were renting sound systems. And then from there, um, we had some friends that were like fans that loved to come to our parties and they were just mad about Wicked and they had just found this bus, this beautiful 1947 Greyhound bus mm -hmm. in a scrapyard, and it, you know, it was in a state of disrepair, but it had belonged to this Baptist church group. It had all this history and it was just, you know, ready for the next chapter, right? So my friend Clay and CB and his his crew, you know, cleaned it all up, ripped out all the seats, put in new seats and everything. And they're like, well, we'll tour with you. I mean, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll drive you around. So then we had a bus, a sound system, a posse, and we just kind of took America by storm and had so much fun doing it. Yeah, any yeah. particular, like, jump out memories from that, that era? Um, I mean, well, it was, to be honest, a lot of the fun was between the gigs. The parties were always phenomenal. We were blowing minds in, you know, Seattle and Portland, LA, San Diego, Denver, mm -hmm. Utah. Um, but the fun for us was like, you know, finding these the, these great hot springs and beautiful locations in between the gigs. So as soon as the gig was over, we'd all like, you know, pile in the bus and just couldn't wait to get out of town, you know, and find some random, you know, spot in the desert that we'd heard about. There was a, there was a book called Hot Springs of the Southwest or Northwest or whatever. And that's that's what we did. And we would like, you know, take acid and get home. 
<laughs> you probably are more familiar with uh, the U.S. and some American board we people. We saw a just lot. Just like really just seeing every small we town. We saw a lot. We, I don't, driving around. We, never, and, yeah. we didn't drive the bus all the way to the east. We'd fly there and we'd yeah. do, we'd do okay, it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But that's, a lot. but that's still a lot of uh, it was a lot of cover. It was yeah. a lot of driving. It was super fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, what aspects of DJing um, drew you in initially? With like the dancing, the creativity, the travel, the um, uh, the meditative aspect of it. Hmm. I mean, it was just. Well, I've always been into music, so looking at the DJ controlling the crowd, getting this ecstatic thing going on, you know, seeing the what the what the emotions you could pull out of people just from playing records mm -hmm. and how creative it was. I mean, I had these mixtapes of Tonka live at the Zap and I listened to those all the time. Uh, Harvey particularly was, was particularly talented. And I just remember this one mix that he did where he's playing this hard, and I remember because I was at the party, but you know, you'd study the tape afterwards. And there, he, would, he played this song, Lauren X Machines, which is a, a Jack in Chicago track, very ma machine, you know, driven, techno we never heard that kind of stuff mm -hmm. before right ever and then he just scratched in um cool and the gang celebrate and i remember it it was immaculate mix but like and i remember at the club when that dropped you know it went from this dark metallic vibe to you know celebrate right ecstasy all around the club and that just struck me as like wow something so incredible and do it yourself right yeah, more, really more interesting amazing. than trying to learn an instrument, a guitar or drums or whatever. So I couldn't well, wait to get my first people's people. art. It's breaking down people's art and figuring out a new creative way to mm -hmm. combine them. That's unexpected, yeah. and everyone's going to come up with something different, which is exciting. Yeah, yeah. Every DJ is different, right? and every set is different. It should be, could yeah. be. Yeah, as well, be. As well, it should be. Um, so, um, how do you think your sound and style has evolved throughout the years? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if it has changed necessarily. I, mean, a lot, I, I like a lot of the same records that I liked mm -hmm. in those early days and not, pretty much every record I've ever bought I have a, an emotional connection to still. So um, I've, I've always liked mixing, you know, disco and acid and techno and house uh, and then occasional like oddities that you wouldn't expect at all, like, you know, some sort of, not rare necessarily, but unusual, hard to find rock dance cut or something, you know, that, People won't even know that it's different when they're dancing, right? They're in the dance, but but I know that it's I've pulled from somewhere else. So has it evolved? I mean, yeah, it's you know you evolve with the records as well because the the, the music changes subtly over time. Like if I listen to old tapes, they'd be like, okay, this was the garage time when there was a lot of vocals. This was the breakbeat time. You know, this was the acid mm. time. This was the techno time. This was the I played a lot of trip hop at one point, I kind of would like to take people suddenly down into a slower tempo, it was fun. So, I mean, reggae, dub, you know, we played a lot of reggae parties. Oh, really? Always dub, yeah. though, always with that psychedelic. Yeah, reggae on the river, and, right? Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, reggae on the river. So how do you feel the energy um, from you playing at like a larger festival versus like a more intimate club? Like the difference in the crowd and how you connect with them, do you it's always Feels the same. Tangible? Yeah, it's always the same. I mean, to be honest, I don't get booked for those huge festivals that you see sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, where there's like a sea of like 20,000 people. I don't, I don't get booked for those. So if I'm playing a festival, I'm usually playing like a smaller situation anyway, where it's like maybe 1,000, 2,000, you know, at the max. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's exactly the same. It's either indoor or it's outdoor. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. There was a time when I did like bigger raves, and I, I can't say I enjoyed them as much. I didn't enjoy them as much. It's hard to feel that connection. Yeah, you feel like crowd's energy. It's just more of a sea. Well, yeah, more of a sea. <laughs> some of them, but not all of them, because I have to say, like, some of the early gatherings, Martin's early parties were really good. They were bigger. He, he deliberately upped the crowd from, you know, like a 500,000 person venue to like a 5,000 person venue. And he kept, the energy was still there in the very early parties, I think, because they, they kept the decks on the floor, you know, which was something they learned from, from us, Wicked. That was our style. You know, you want minimal, you don't want anything to get in the way. Of that interaction, right? A stage, get, that. a stage gets in the way because then everybody's looking up, it's like watching a band, and it's never about that with a DJ. I don't think, unless you're like a dancer, you know, or a <laughs> well, model. It shouldn't be, but there are some people that like I've I met enough DJs that yeah. they're like they feed off of that feeling like a god. Right on, but, yeah. Yeah, but it's, too, yeah, yeah. yeah, but it's yeah. it's really like I love to hear when you're like I want to feel the energy of the crowd. Yeah, that's it for me. Yeah. 
Because then you're, you're, I'm going to be engaged in this set the entire time. Mm -hmm. I would rather it was just totally dark on the DJ so you couldn't see me at all and I could just see the dancers and only then just a little bit. Yeah. You know, I like it just dark and moody, right? Yeah, you yeah. Know, mood lighting. So you've been such an integral part of the um, scene in the Bay Area since the 90s. Mm. How uh, do you think it's changed from then until now? How, do, anything tangible or noticeable? or? Um, well, parties like this are great because you can see the 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 thread super easily between mm -hmm. this and a party like Community that we started off doing with Malachi and Simon, my roommate, um, where it was just a midweek thing, you know, it's just like just locals that are down for the music, there's no hype, you know. And, uh, and so that's just pretty much the same. But other than that, obviously the city's a lot more expensive, so there's less kind of arty types, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, but, you know, it's, 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 it's what I see is the same, right? I don't live here anymore, I come here and it's the nightlife, so yeah. it's the same. Yeah, I mean, the, the parties like this keep that sense of love for the music mm -hmm. like yeah, alive so much. Um, yeah. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm so happy to be a part of it. So what is your musical background? Are you self-taught? Um, do you play any instruments? Uh, I, I play a bit of percussion. I used to have a lot of percussion instruments. Um, I haven't made as much music as I used to at all, but I mean, I used to have like a, you know, a, a studio set up and make electronic music in my studio with samplers and keyboards and uh, and all that and uh, my, my favorite instrument to play was the space echo just for the you know that was pretty much on it all the tracks you know, that kind of dub echo influence the, of the saturated tape i love that um but was i self-taught yeah um but i i went to a boarding school where there was nothing to do at night but my one passion at the school was being in the choir and singing so I had a really good music teacher and he sort of took me under his wing and made me, I was like head of the choir. I was in three different choirs and obviously it wasn't the kind of music I would ever listen to again, but I was singing, right? Mm -hmm. So I learned, you know, all this kind of stuff. I mean, I can't read music, but I, I, I learned to um, hear by ear, mm -hmm. pitch, tempo, you know, subtleties and stuff like that, which is great for DJ. Yeah, yeah. it's amazing what learning to sing and Hearing music like yeah. that will, will do for you. Um, so, uh, uh, how did touring with the rest of the Wicked Sound System on the bus and playing events like Burning Man and Reggae, Reggae on the River influence um, and inspire you as a producer when mm. you made that switch? Well, that's a good question. Um, it wasn't really all of us that toured, at the, that did those parties. It was actually me and Marky that would do Reggae on the River mm -hmm. and Burning Man. Uh, Thomas moved away at that point, around 95, he moved to the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And that's when we did our first, set up the first sound system at Burning Man, the first big sound system at Burning Man. Um, yeah, it was inspiring because it was the first time we'd ever heard the sound system um, properly. It's made for festivals, it's made to be an outdoor system, so there's nothing, it sounds way better when there's nothing, uh, no walls to get in the way. You know, it just sounded acoustically perfect out there. Didn't even have to EQ it. Just yeah. turn it on and boom, you know. So that was nice. So that was inspiring. So the music sounded different, different. it sounded better. Um, and Reggae on the River, again, CB and my friends that had the bus, they were already going to Reggae on the River. They were reggae heads. Mm -hmm. They just got into Wiki because they thought that we were kind of, we had this psychedelic dubby thing going on. That was their connection to it. So th I remember CB telling me, I'm bringing you up to Reggae on the River. And he bought me a ticket. And he goes, we're going to have you DJ. We're going to, we, we bring the bus up there every year. We're just going to set up the decks and you're going to DJ all night. And there wasn't anybody else doing it then. So we just had this kind of DIY attitude of just plugging in and going. No one else was doing it. So I had a lot of fun doing that. And then uh, first year I played house, but then the next year I played dub because I figured it was a reggae festival. It was rude of me just to show up with house music. And it went down really well, so much so that 10 years later we were still doing the you know, the, the sound system after the stage died down all night, and we were the only one that they would allow to do it, because we were self-policing, we were like, you know, we were good like that. We had had a good crew of people that took care of, you know, our people, all of us basically, make sure nothing stupid happened. Yeah, respect for it. Yeah, you know, because people were, you know, we didn't close the bus off and lock it off so people couldn't get on it. Anybody that was at that party with us could get on the bus. And so, you know, some curious people would come on, so it was like, you know, we were right in the thick of it, which is, which is where it's at, right? I love that because that's also, also why I felt like I found a home in San Francisco so mm. much. Because that is when you go to mm. the Sunset Camp Out or parties like that, it's, yeah. 
it's integral in how the San Francisco scene was built mm -hmm, and how mm -hmm. it still is. It's the community of people that love the music that are responsible mm -hmm. and take care of each other and have no judgment and are just big music fans. Mm -hmm. And I really think Wicked Sound System was like the precursor to a lot of those same things that are still going on. Yeah, yeah, I'm not going to deny that for you. No, yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, it's definitely really true. <laughs> They've done a really good job, though, Sunset, of like keeping it going and moving forward. Carrying the torch yeah, yeah, yeah. of, of that And that atmosphere. festival is just like a beautiful uh, kind of coming together of everything, you know. The mm. lineups are insane. Like the, 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 it's such a beautiful location. There's art everywhere. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they have done a great job. But the same vibe is exactly what Wicked was trying to and doing back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. So we, were, we weren't that organized is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was more chaotic, you know. It, it was just like, we were just doing it. We plug and play anyway. We mm -hmm. did full moons every single month for six years. If you think about it, that's a lot of parties, that's right? That's a lot. It is and a we lot. couldn't just do it at the same beach or the same park because the cops would show up. So we'd yeah. always have to be like looking for a new location or whatever. And of course it was free and it's exhausting. You know, we wouldn't even get out of the city till like midnight. Yeah. yeah. Just by the time everyone got organized, you know, we get down there and like the party would already have taken on a life of its own. Purely for the love of it. Purely for the on love the, of it, on yeah. it honestly. Purely for the love of it. But, you know, we got, we kind of lost uh, control of it a little bit, you know. There'd be like 3,000 people there uh, wow. sometimes. Like Rolling Stone got wind of it and showed up and reviewed it once. Really? Like, yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, 93. That's 90, amazing. 93? It was the two-year anniversary. It was 93. Yeah. I'm going to have to look up that article yeah. and post it along with yeah. this so people can read about yeah. it. That's Somebody jumped in a fire. Story. I thought he was Jesus, you know, I thought he was like sacrificing himself into the fire. When he took his clothes off, they always seem to take their clothes off first. <laughs> yes. And then jumped in the fire. The cleans so, cleansing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, not, to laugh, not to laugh about that, but... But we didn't even have cell phones in those days, but somehow... You know, we got him out of there. They, they, they came in with helicopters and they had to shut so down okay. Highway 1. And yeah, we never heard anything else about it. Yeah. It was just like all part of the party. Yeah, well, there was the one guy who got flown off in a helicopter. But yeah, great night, right? I was going to ask you about one of the most like crazy memories you have, but that must have been probably in the top. That was one of them, but there was, there was a few. There was one guy one time in the first year anniversary, we were having a lovely party at Greywell Cove, which was a private beach. He, he never let us talk him, talk him into throwing another full moon party there. Unfortunately, that place is amazing. But there was this guy who decided, he was walking his dog in the morning, I think, or maybe he was just walking, and he, he saw there was a party down below and he got too close to the cliff and he fell down the cliff to the bottom where we were. And, you know, nobody stopped because everybody's high and just dancing. We're like, oh, well, that's a bit awkward. Well, we'll just carry on. So you, know, you didn't want to move the, the You didn't want to move the guy. No one's got a cell phone. Oh my so there's goodness. a guy just sort of sitting there and he landed, seems to have landed sitting up. So. We carried on. <laughs> oh my god! Stuff like that, you know. There was always like something. Yeah, another time, I think it was in um, Bonnie Dune in Santa Cruz. Some guy, sw no, got, got maybe waded out to a rock that was. The tide came in really quickly, and he was too high to get in. The tide kept on coming in, obviously, mm -hmm. and eventually we realised, oh wow, this guy's, you know, the waves are getting crazy, and he's stuck out on this rock. So. Again, somehow the helicopters figured out this guy was here. And they came in and dropped the line down and then some hero came out of the helicopter to get him out. If I saw that, well, we're just dancing, dance, you know. I would have just would have blown my mind. Right, yeah, it's a bit much. <laughs> it's a bit much. <laughs> like, did they plan this? I right, yeah, excellent know. visuals that night. <laughs> yes, yeah. Yeah. What a backdrop. Performance art at its finest. At its finest. Um, so in 1996, Wicked Records first and one of the most successful releases, 20 Minutes of Disco Glory. Yeah. It was a collaboration between you and ETI. Yeah. Um, how did that collaboration come about? What was the experience like? Um, yeah, I met um, I met Tim and Eric through um, CB and the bus and those guys. He was like, you know, they, they were part of that crew. They were living up in Humboldt, and um, they were already start, They were already making some music. Mm -hmm. They'd started. They'd put one record out, I think. And I just remember thinking at Burning Man in '96, I had this big. Was it '95? Maybe it was '95. Yeah, '95. I just had a revelation when I was there. Like, I really want to make a record. I need to make a record in order to kind of, you know, go to the next level. And I'm going to hook up with Eric because we are, I wanted to just work, you know, with him because he and I had a good rapport. And uh, he's like, well, me and, uh, you know, our studio set up at Tim's house, so come over. So we went over there together and I had some samples um, of stuff that I wanted it, you know, that were an inspiration, you know, and I had a bass line in my head. So I remember I couldn't play anything, but, you know, I could do like a, you know, they turn the keyboard on and I remember playing the bass line. And um, they're like, that's awesome, um, cool. 
and then they pitched it down, I think, from what I was playing it. And then Tim Boone was pretty good with the 303, the acid making machine. So then he duped that, uh, made another acid line out of that. And so then um, we decided, well, let's bring in a live bass player to play the bass notes so it would just sound more full because I was into this kind of disco, you know, stuff, production. I really liked that disco production more than anything, like Bo Hannon and Patrick Cowley, like the producers that had this really big, epic, cosmic sound. I wanted that with acid. That was the dream. And um, so we brought in this bass player and he was really good at listening to, you know, what I... I was just humming the stuff and he was able to just play it. And at one point, um, I said, oh, can you do a little slap bass stuff? And he did this little slap bass bit and it was perfect. That became the break in the song. And it just came together like that. We found a percussionist. I worked with him. I played my pattern basically and then he played it better. And we recorded all that. And then it was, it was a really successful record. We sold like 20,000 copies in the end. Not all on Wicked Records. I did remixes on Greyhound later as well. Mm -hmm. So it obviously got me really fired up because that was the first one. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of releases since then. Yeah, fun. that was the um, one, though. In 1998, you founded um, <clears throat> Greyhound Recordings, which was a nod to the Greyhound bus that you guys mm, toured on. That's it. Um, so, uh, and I've released 54 singles from, the, from California recording artists um, and became the home label for your own projects and singles. What was the goal and the mission of your label when you first started it, and how did that come about? Yeah, oh, I just wanted to keep sticking out my own records without having to deal with, you know, the man right? or, or anybody else, really. You know, I, I like, it's just so much better when you, there's no bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd done three records on Wicked, but it was, it was supposed to be a joint project, and at that point it hadn't turned into a group project. Like, the other guys weren't ready. So I just was like, okay, I'm just gonna let that sit for a bit and then I'm gonna just start my own thing. Cause it didn't seem fair, you know, Wicked Records featuring Garth again, right? So the first uh, few records were by, by, were by me and then people start, and then I, you know, I hit up obviously my Wicked homies to see if they would want to contribute and they did. Thomas did an amazing track, The Mirror Boys. Um, you know, Yana and Margie did really good remixes of the Disco Glory. Uh, and stuff like that. So, and then people started sending in their demos, and I was like, "Wow, this is interesting." You know, <laughs> listen to people's music. So I always had a stack of demos to listen to. Occasionally, there'd be something that really hit the spot and sounded like what we were trying to do. So that's how it, it just grew. Yeah, and you even released um, three records, like remixing all or making mixes from all of the um, singles from the, these artists as well. Oh, you've done your homework, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> You've definitely done your homework. <laughs> nice. Well, I put out a couple of mixed CDs, mm -hmm. you know, three actually, throughout the duration, yeah. just because the CD market was really big at that point. Mm -hmm. we were, I was licensing a lot of the catalogue to other DJ CDs, so I was like, well, I may as well do my own. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that one you were talking about was a sampler for the second CD, Revolutions in Sound. Mm -hmm. But it's, yeah, it was, you know, every, there was nothing planned. It was all just like one release leads to another, one thing leads to another. Unfortunately, the industry that you know, I had come to know and love, which was analog people making actual products, record CDs. It all died, like right after September 11th, I think. It was, I don't know what happened, but that just kind of killed that music business. So it took my label with it. Yeah. And many others besides, and all the distributors and all the stores and stuff. There was a real culture that, that, was a, that, was, that went with it, and that's, that's a shame. And it's so different now than it was. I mean, it's always evolving, but there's been mm -hmm. such a huge shift. I really miss that. Mm. record shops because that was the, the where the community would gather in every city it's mm. nice that there's a resurgence of people record mm -hmm. shopping though it's great. Yeah. in the last like decade yeah. people are getting yeah. really into yeah. it again but particularly now i was just djing an in-store at amoeba records in la the other day and um there were these three 19 year old girls that were coming out and they were like and they were fiending for records they had a little notepad and they're like what was that one what's this what, what would you call this kind of music and then they'd go off digging they were like 18 19 you know they, they were diggers. It was awesome. It's a timing. Yeah. It's a timeless like piece of art. I honestly. think so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's nice. St it stood the test of time when a lot of other formats have fallen yeah, by the yeah. wayside. I've never played I've anything forgotten. but records. Actually, never. I've never played a single CD in a club. I only ever bought like one CD. Mm -hmm. So it was never for me, and I never DJ with a laptop or anything either. Or so. For me, it's, that's, that's the art form. That's what I do. Yeah, what about it attracted you versus the CDJs? Um, I did meet someone that she said, like, 
for her it's like a, it's a tangible physical thing like that's how she knows mm -hmm. her records it's by touch it's by yeah. right. seeing them right, right. she's like I couldn't I could never I respect people that do CDJs but I could not um, how is it for yeah. you? Um, yeah, I think like that. I mean, I'm very visual and I need to just see it. Like, I can't, I don't have the best name, uh, the best mind for names at all. You know, there's people I've been seeing for 20 plus years and I still don't know their names. There's a soul connection. It's always good to see them. We'll mm -hmm. hug or whatever. But I just don't worry about that. It's words, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like recognizing the label and the, you know, that's how I can flick through it. And it's, I don't know, it's just, I like it. I don't, I'm not envious of anybody that I look at seeing them DJ with, with CDs. It doesn't look interesting to me, but God bless them, you know, everybody else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so before we move on to talking some more about um, recent projects, mm. uh, you played three times now at Hospitality. This will be your fourth time. Uh, the first time you actually did really? it. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I asked Victor. Yeah, nice. he said this will be your fourth time. Nice. The first time you played Open to Close. Uh, how any standout memories from your past hospitality experiences? I remember the back to back one with Yana was an, a total roaster. That was really good. I mean, those those uh, mm. <laughs> the sets that you guys do together are pretty historic. Really, really long. Another historic to, set. <laughs> <laughs> because because it's like you guys. You guys, it's longevity. It's like you guys back to back for hours and they're epic journey sets. I love it. I, I mean, there's no one else I would rather play back to back with than that guy. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's beautiful. It's seamless. It's like, you know, we just, you know, we can throw each other a curveball and, and work with it and come right out of it with, you know, with something that made it even better, you know. It's beautiful. Like it's a rare. It's match. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but not competitive, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a beautiful thing and it's rare. Um, that we started doing these extended sets in Japan because they're kind of greedy over there and they like, you know, they were like, they like you to play for hours and hours and hours. And even we were surprised after like nine hours or something, we're like, are we still going? They, are they still here? You know? <laughs> so now we can do that and it's no problem. We just, we just did it in LA at a friend's um, party. What's yeah. the longest you've ever backed to back? I think nine hours might be it actually, but um, I've, the longest set I've ever played is 15 hours. It was the closing night. That was just me all night. That was um, wow. the closing night of 39 Hotel in Hawaii. It was the club that Harvey was involved with. Yeah. And they knew that they were closing it forever. And it had been such a lovely club. They'd been there 10 years. So we just kept on going. Yeah. <laughs> and going and going. That's a long till time. Till literally, it was like a war zone when we, when we got out of there. Like some, someone had broken their leg. I mean, I could barely, like, my back was like, you know, I could barely move. I mean, it was, yeah. we put in the hours, man. We went out strong. Yeah, that's that's incredible. Okay, so in in two thousand and one, you moved to LA. Mm. Um, I thought to pursue no, acting. Two, no, two thousand ten. Oh, not two thousand one. Oh, no, it's two thousand ten. All right, I said the typing the one and zero. Yeah, no, I was, okay, two thousand ten. Okay, yeah. two thousand ten. I was in the Bay Area for twenty years. Okay, ten down there. So two thousand ten, you moved to LA. Yeah. Um, was acting always a passion of yours? Have you had you done it before? Before this project came. Uh, to the it? only thing I'd ever done was I'd had the lead part in the school play, and and won the school acting cup. It was the only thing that, apart from the choir, that I did at school that was you know kind of worth a damn. So that was cool, and I and I did. I remember thinking as a young teenager, like you know, I'm going to be an actor, but then you know the opportunities don't arise, right? You don't want to. I didn't want to put tights on and go and do like a bunch of plays. I was like. I was into clubbing and music and all that kind of stuff. I, it wasn't cool enough, mm -hmm. I didn't think, you know. Um, so yeah, I fell into it and it's been a really amazing journey. I've been really challenged by it and I'm really enjoying it. And it's, uh, it's nice at this point to be given a kind of a, what's the word I'm thinking of? Like a second chapter, if you like. No, I was, it's like, no, it'll come to me in a minute, right, when I get out of here, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're going to be like, damn, yeah. I have the right words. Yeah, but anyway, <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 it's nice to have something else to do, you know, because mm. DJing can be a trap. You know, I'm a DJ, that's all I do. My whole ego and everything is identified with DJing. And I don't want that, you know. I'm 52 now, I love DJing, even more now sometimes than when I was DJing all the time, professionally, you know, on a plane every weekend, you know, because now it's really fun, right? Now I do it just because I really want to do it. Mm. Not because I have to or because I need money. So it's good to have another creative avenue that's also making some money, which yeah, we all need. Challenge. Right? Yeah, challenge. Um, so you had your big debut uh, 
big screen debut in Speed Dragon that premiered in the Cannes Film Festival and went on to win the New York Independence Independent Film Festival as well. Yeah, it did. Uh, that's really exciting. Tell me about that experience. I know you talked a little bit about how it came about, which was a documentary that they wanted right, to do right. about. Right, it was Dan here. Frank was the yeah. writer and director. and He actually had lived in San Francisco at one point. He was a promoter here. That's how he knew me. He bought, booked me for some party years ago. Um, so I, you know, I'm very grateful for Dan for like giving me that uh, spark and opportunity. He took a total risk on me. He didn't know if I could act, you know, at all, right? He just, um, we, we met in a bar. He's like, he's talking to me about this um, music documentary. And then he goes, you know, I'm making this film right now, a feature film. And I think, you know, you might be good for this character, Carl. He's kind of a, you know, manipulative music guy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know how to take that. Is this thinking. a compliment? <laughs> yeah. Interesting. But he goes, but the part's yours if you want it. You know, so I showed up and I made sure that I wasn't caught with my pants down, that I you know, knew what I was going to do on set. I just acted like I'd been on set before and like no one questioned it. And it was great. I was shitting myself. I was nervous. The confidence you probably learned behind the decks and uh, touring so much yeah. probably yeah. translated really well into walking yeah, it helped. and feeling cool and calm. Yeah, it helped. Like an inner confidence. But I was definitely very churned up. And uh, it's about something, you know, that's going to be forever, right? Yeah. <laughs> if someone wants to dig around, it's forever. Yeah. Anyway, so that yeah. was the first of many films. I've done, I've done a lot of films. Um, you know, smaller films, obviously, that you're never going to hear, some of them. Um, but one of them is coming up called Lost Angeles uh, by this very talented film writer and director, Jesse Dvorak. Um, and I play a priest who's lost his uh, church because of the skyrocketing rents or whatever. So, you know, I kind of hit the dark side, you know. That'll be really interesting. Yeah, when does I'm that come out? Um, I'm not sure when it'll be coming out, but it just, you know, it's probably still in the editing phase right now. Okay. But the, but the film finished shooting last year. So that was a, you know, a big role in that film. And it's, it's going to be really good. It looks amazing. Well, I've seen already of it, so I'm excited about that. Um, and I had a very small part in a big film that just hit the screens right now, the Ford versus Ferrari one, the one with Matt Damon and... Yeah. Yeah, so it's very small if you blink you'll miss me, but I'm in it, so... Yeah, that's you know. exciting. Yeah, it's fun. How do you keep a balance between um, both careers? Because uh, you are still like a very active touring artist. Yeah, so. I love to DJ still, and I've just, it's been a good year. I just DJed in uh, Croatia and Thailand at that uh, Wonder Fruit Festival. It was amazing. There's, there's a few things boiling. They're going to bring me back again next year. Um, but it doesn't take up all my time. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to take up all my time, so... You know, I spend much more time, I guess, um, you know, auditioning. You don't, they don't just give you acting jobs. You've got to go out there and hustle for them. And so even if I'm doing a commercial, I've done a lot of commercials. I just did, um, just did a new one. I, you can't talk about it until it comes out. But, you know, that's fun as well. Because they're like, they, no, no. <laughs> but they, they do these, you know, the production value on those things is it's like a film. You know, they're like mm -hmm. huge um, productions with the advertising agencies there. It's like it could be high stress if you allowed it to be. Mm. But they're also super fun, right? So I've been, I've been doing quite a lot of those. And so they're daytime things anyway. My point is they, they do those in the week. It's yeah. Monday, to, Monday to Friday. So you got your weekends open yeah. for all the Still different DJ gigs you want. Yeah. yeah, it's perfect. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, I guess finally, any um, current projects or gigs you'd like to share outside of your upcoming um, releases? <laughs> There'll be a wicked party, I think, in the summer, but you know, who knows when and where. And I'll definitely be back to the Wonder Fruit thing in Thailand. I, you know, I can't even remember what else is coming up, but there's a few bits and bobs. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm excited for tonight. This is going to be good. It'll be really good. Yeah. Cole opening up into you. Cole it's opening be up. Perfect. Yeah. It's going to be perfect. Great. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah, me too. Really looking forward to it. Yeah. All right. I guess that's all the questions yeah. I have. Well, thanks for having me there. Yeah, it was yeah. fun.